Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Conrad Washington. I'm the director here at the Center for Faith Based Neighborhood Partnerships. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. This webinar is a collaboration between U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Center for Faith Based Neighborhood Partnerships, and the Veteran Health Administration Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention, Education and Training. Everyone's phone has been muted. If you have a question during the presentation today, please type in the Q&A box on the right of the screen. Someone will read the question at the end of the presentation, and our presenter, Ms. Lily Mills, will provide a response. This presentation is not available after this webinar. However, uh, handouts will be available uh, along with resources as well. So we thank you all for choosing to hang out with us today. We know you could have been a lot of places. I know many of you are enjoying uh, religious celebrations such as Lent and Ramadan. Uh, during the March month of March, rather, uh, the recognition of Women History Month is significant as we recognize the contributions of women uh, to this country. March is also National Social Worker Month as well, which is a time to celebrate the great profession of social work. And the theme for uh, social work for 2023 is social work breaks barriers. So keep that on your uh, on your radar there. And lastly, and certainly not least, um, we recognize this month for the upcoming National Vietnam War Veterans Day, which is March 29th. We thank our Vietnam veterans for their service, uh, for their bravery and sacrifice as well. Um, and so I'm also pleased to thank Ms. Lily Mills, who's actually detailed to this office for uh, conducting this webinar. We know that suicide prevention is preventable. She's going to share a lot of pertinent information that I'm excited about, and I believe that uh, everyone will benefit. So without further ado, I would like to thank Ms. Lily Mills for her co collaboration. We're grateful for her. Uh, we want to introduce her. She will be providing the presentation. You can read a summary of her bio to the left of the screen. Uh, Lily is a licensed clinician, clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience. She's worked in various capacities to include child abuse, domestic violence, and substance abuse. Lily is an Air Force veteran. We won't hold that against us, against her as uh, I'm a retired Marine, right? <laughs> and has served uh, as director of psychological health for Virginia Air National Guard. Lily has been with the Department of Veteran Affairs since 2013, working in suicide prevention. Currently, she's the education and training program coordinator at the Office of Mental Health Suicide Prevention uh, at the VA Central Office. At this time, I give you the wonderful Ms. Lily Mills. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, muted, ma'am. Always forget to unmute. So go. I was saying thank you, Mr. Washington, and thank you for acknowledging Social Work Month. Um, we really appreciate that because there's so many great social workers in that in this field. So I want to go ahead and get started with my presentation. I am going to turn off my video because we have sometimes bandwidth problems and then towards the end with questions, I'll go ahead and turn it back on. So, as we begin, the 1st thing I always like to find out who our audience is. So, I want to know uh, how many veterans we have in the audience or how many reservists or. Uh, reserve members, so uh, any army folks in the uh, house today. You could just type in the uh, Q and a box, whether you're army. What about Navy? Any Navy folks there? Uh oh, I see some army. I see aim high air force. All right. What about our uh, Marines? We already got 2 in the house, uh, Mr. Washington and Mr. Morales. So I'm outnumbered, but uh, any Marines in the house? I see some guard. What about the reserves? All right. And what about our Coast Guard? I think I said Navy. I think we got everybody accounted for today. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. The reason I like to find out who's in the audience is because you really have a deeper appreciation. Oh, I forgot the Space Force. Sorry about that. Space Force. So I really have a deep appreciation for all of the folks who have served in all branches of the service because we each bring something different to the table. And you really have a deeper appreciation, especially once you've served alongside each branch. I actually deployed with each branch. And so I have a, a deep appreciation for what each branch brings to the table. So just want to acknowledge everybody for that. So with suicide prevention, first, I want to say is that um, it can be an intense topic for some people. 
most of us have been touched by suicide in one form or fashion. And so I just want to let you know that if you're having a difficult time and you need to take a break and step out of the presentation, please, please do so. There's not going to be any gory details or anything like that, but sometimes just bringing up suicide prevention may present some problems for folks. So I want to give you the uh, National Prevention uh, Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 988. We've moved away from the 1-800-273-8255, and that's very good news, and I'll talk about that later in the presentation. But now you can dial 988, same way you dial 911, and reach someone who can help with a mental health crisis. And um, if you press number one, you'll be directed to the crisis line, and you'll get a peer counselor. So that's just good news that just happened over the last year. Next slide, please. So this is what we're going to cover today, facts about veteran suicide, common myths and realities, and then I'm going to go over this, the VA save steps, and this is our suicide prevention gatekeeper training, if you will. It's really our suicide one-on-one -on -one training, and it's really for everyone. And then I'm going to have some resources at the end, and then we'll open it up from some Q&A. Next slide. So by participating in this training, you'll have a general understanding of the scope of suicide within the U.S. and know how to identify someone who may be at risk for suicide and know what to do when once you do identify that individual. So those are the tools that we want to give you today. Next slide. So my first second question to you all is what is your biggest question around suicide and talking to people in crisis? What is your biggest question around suicide and talking to people in crisis? If you want to go ahead and type a few of those questions in the box. And then hopefully by the time I get to the end of the presentation, I would have answered that question for you. Next slide, please. So let's go over some facts about suicide, veteran suicide. Next slide, please. So suicide is a national public health problem. It's a crisis as far as the Department of Veterans Affairs is concerned. It's a national issue rates are rising among the general population as well as veterans. And so we have to do something and we have to educate the public. And so for every death by suicide, there's about 135 individuals that are impacted. And I would venture to say that there's probably more than that. When you think about that one individual, the lives that they touch, their families, their coworkers, if they belong to uh, any institutions, religious institutions, if they're going to school, their neighbors. It's just so many people that are impacted. And so I venture to say it's probably more than 135, but at minimum, we can say that it's 135. Next slide. So suicide is often the result of a complex interaction of risks and protective factors at the individual, community, and societal level. So there's no one single cause of suicide. And so risk factors are those things that cause us to be overwhelmed, they increase the likelihood of suicidal behaviors. Pro protective factors are those things that offset those behaviors. These are the skills, the tools, the resources that we use to mitigate those suicidal behaviors. So to prevent suicide, we have to maximize the protective factors and minimize the risk factors. So get rid of those obstacles, those challenges, those things that are difficult to deal with and get the resources and use the resources that are available. Next slide. So now I wanna take a look at the risk factors and protective factors. Now here you have a list. This is not an all inclusive list. These are some of the more prominent ones that we see, but believe me, we can have pages of this stuff, pages, but I'm just gonna cover a few today. So risk factors, remember what I said, these are those challenges, those obstacles, those things that get in the way, those things that are overwhelming, those stressful things. And so here are some of the things that we need to look for. Prior suicide attempt. Someone has had a prior suicide attempt, they're actually at risk for suicide. Doesn't mean that they will always go ahead and have another attempt, but it does put them at a greater risk than someone who has not engaged in that behavior. Next, mental health issues. So when we talk about mental health issues, we talk about all those things, depression, anxiety, PTSD, all these things that people are experiencing, but really the key is, is that they go untreated. 
So when you have untreated mental health issues, it definitely puts you at a greater risk for suicide than someone who's actually engaged in treatment and receiving the help that they need. Next, substance abuse. So when we talk about substance abuse, we're talking about alcohol and drugs. That's what we're talking about. And so anytime you engage in the use of alcohol and drugs, especially when you've got mental health issues going on, depression, anxiety, all of that, it definitely puts you at a greater risk. Anytime you use a substance that alters your mood, it also alters your judgment. So that puts that individual at greater risk for suicide as well. Access to lethal means. So when we talk about lethal means, we're talking about things that will actually, the person would use to actually commit suicide. And so the VA really has taken a big stance on lethal means. And number one lethal means is weapons, guns. People are using guns at a higher rate than any other means of suicide. And so when you have access to lethal means and you have all these other things that are going on, it does put you at a greater risk for suicide. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about lethal means in, in a few moments. Next, recent loss. So when we talk about recent loss, it could be loss of life. They could have lost someone close to them. It could be loss of limb. It could be loss of job. When you have recent loss, it definitely puts you at a greater risk for suicide. Next, legal or financial issues. Legal issues, especially when you're facing jail time. When you're about to face jail time, it definitely puts you at a greater risk for suicide. Just the thought of having your freedom taken away and being locked up, that's enough to put someone at risk for suicide. Or financial challenges when people are dealing with bankruptcy, the possibility of losing their job, their home, all of their income, it definitely puts them at a risk for suicide. Next on the list, relationship issues. When we talk about relationship issues, especially those issues, those relationships that dissolve. Sometimes when you're going through a relationship breakup, it can almost feel like you're going through the grieving process when you lose someone to death. You go through the same issues, denial, the shame, the guilt, the anger. These are the same issues that you go through when you're dealing with grief. So relationship issues are big. They're very big on the list of risk factors for suicide. Next, unemployment. So when you're unemployed, obviously you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your family, it puts you at a greater risk, and then homelessness. And we have a lot of homelessness going on in this country and in veterans, and so definitely it puts them at a greater risk. Now, when we move to the other side of the screen, we're looking at protective factors. Now remember, protective factors are those things, those skills, those tools that you can use to mitigate those challenges and those obstacles. These are things that we can use to help us navigate through those crises. So access to mental health care. So remember, if you have mental health issues, anxiety, depression, you could be schizophrenic, bipolar. If you're getting treated for these issues, you are in a better position than someone who's not being treated for those issues. So we wanna make sure that those issues are being taken care of. Sense of connectedness. So when we talk about sense of connectedness, we're talking about, you know, as military folks, when you're serving on the base, you're with your unit, you know who's in your unit, you know what your mission is, you know who your battle buddy is. Sometimes when you leave the military, you leave those gates, you lose that sense of connectedness. There's not that camaraderie that's there. And especially think about if you join the military at a very young age, 19, 20 years old, you had a 20 year career. That's half of your adult life. Half of your adult life is spent in uniform with these people that you're serving with. And so you have that sense of connectedness. Problem solving skills. Now, Mr. Washington always laughs about this, but I'm a gal who grew up in New York City and there was only one way we knew how to solve problems. Anybody know how they solve problems in New York? When I was a kid, drop it in the box. There was only one way we knew how to solve problems. Any answers in the Q&A? Throw hands, there you go, there you go. Throw hands, yes, we fought it out and we fought it to the death. 
But I will tell you, it's not a good way to solve problems. It's not a good way to resolve issues. And the one thing, if, you know, if we learn how to solve problems, it can help us earlier, later on in life. If we learn how to do it early enough, it can help us later on in life. And so what happens is, is when we don't know how to problem solve, we use things that are not good to problem solve, like fighting, like self-medicating, those kinds of things. And so if you know how to solve problems or you have problem solving skills, it's definitely gonna be a positive protective factor. Next, sense of uh, spirituality. And this is very individualized for everyone. Uh, some people will practice formal religion. Some people will actually go to a religious institution. Some people will meditate. Some people read the Bible. It depends on what works for that individual. And so that is a wide range of things that could be um, useful. And so some people use many combinations as well, but it's very individualized. Next on the list, mission or purpose. So when we have a mission or purpose, we know why we're here, we know what we're doing. And remember earlier I said about the connectiveness, you know what you're doing, you know what your unit mission is. And sometimes when you leave the military, it's not always clear what your mission is. And so finding that mission and purpose is always positive. A lot of us veterans, we go back and we want to help other veterans. We work for the VA, we work for uh, veteran service organizations because we want to give back. We want to help our fellow, fellow um, service members. And so having that mission or purpose can always be positive. Next, physical health. There's nothing worse than walking around in physical pain all day long with ailments that are untreated. Um, I know a personal friend who was suffering from um, sciatic nerve pain. And the way they described it is the worst pain ever. They said it's worse than childbirth. And so when you have pain like that, you have to get treatment. You have to get treatment because you can't even think straight when you have that kind of pain. So we wanna make sure that those physical ailments are taken care of and that we're getting our physicals each year. We're taking care of the little things and not ignoring them because, you know, as military people, we're used to sucking up a lot of stuff. You know, I didn't feel any pain until I left the military and I was like, wow, this does hurt. <laughs> it never hurt when I was in the military because we tend to suck it up and just keep moving forward. And so we really have to take a look at those things and make sure that we're getting treated for them. Next, employment. So you're always gonna be in a positive position if you're employed. You know, if you're unemployed, you can't take care of your family, you can't take care of your friends, you can't take care of your children, your spouse. It's very difficult. Imagine looking at your children on Christmas and you can't afford to buy them anything. You can't afford food on the table. It's very difficult. So if you're employed and you're able to provide for yourself and your family, it's definitely going to be a positive protective factor. And last on this list, social and emotional well-being. So if you're involved in things that are socially engaging, where you can feel like you're contributing, it's always going to be positive. You know, um, you know, I laugh with friends, you know, sometimes who stay home because they say, you know, they stay home with their younger kids and they say, you know what, I got to get out because I'm in this mode where I'm just talking to little people all day long. I need some stimulation. So you want to make sure that you're engaging. It helps your emotional well-being. Next slide. And we definitely want to make sure on that list that we boost the protective factors and minimize the risk factors. Okay, here, this is the percentage of deaths and methods involved. This is this chart is a little bit old and we are updating it. This goes back to 2019, but these statistics are very alarming and they're pretty close to what we have today. So this is the lethal means that I was talking about earlier. So when we talk about lethal means, these are the methods that people are using veterans and non-veterans. So remember I said guns, look at the firearms. That's the number one method that's being used. So our non-veteran adults on this chart, almost 48%, almost 48% are using firearms. Look at the veteran population, 69%. 69% are using firearms. Non-veteran women, 31%. Look at the veteran females. 49%, almost 50% are using firearms. Non-veteran men, 53%, and veteran men, over 
So that tells you that the VA has had to do things different when it comes to lethal means, lethal means safety, and lethal means training. We had to educate our providers, educate our veterans, and educate family members on lethal means and lethal means safety. Now, when you look at the, the rest of the uh, methods on the list, they don't even come close. Poisoning, suffocation, and then other, that's the lowest category. So other could be a variety of things. It could be jumping from heights, ramming your vehicle into a fixed object, those sort of things, but they don't even come close to firearms. And so we've had to do a lot with firearms and we still have a lot more that we need to do with firearms and firearm education. Next slide. So lethal means safety. So what is lethal means safety? So in the context of suicide prevention, it's safe storage of lethal means is any action that builds in time and space between a suicidal impulse and the ability to harm oneself. So again, lethal means safety is any action that builds in time and space between a suicidal impulse and the ability to harm oneself. So we wanna build that time and space in between there. When that person has that thought, we wanna buffer in there. We wanna be able to have safe storage of that weapon if they have a weapon. We wanna be able to have the crisis line number available, 988, something easily that they can dial, a safety plan so that they can reach out to someone for help. So effective lethal means safety, education, and counseling is collaborative. Remember I said earlier, we had to educate providers, we educated veterans, we educated family members. So it's collaborative, it's veteran-centered, and it respects the important role that firearms and medications play in a veteran's life. We know that for some people, they need medication based on their injuries and their illnesses. We know in this society, people have the right to bear arms. We don't want to solely take that away from them. But one of the things that the VA has done is we have to look back at how are we putting out this information? What is going to work best for the veteran and their family? And so initially, if someone was suicidal, the initial thought was, and it did happen, we would call the authorities and that weapon would be confiscated permanently. And that was in the story. And we thought, okay, that's great. This is what's gonna help save lives. But what we found is that it didn't work. People were just dishonest about owning a weapon or having access to a weapon because they knew it was gonna be confiscated. So we had to change the dialogue. So the dialogue now has, been, has become, we know you have a weapon, but you're in a crisis. How about we get you to lock that weapon up, safely store it until you can get through the crisis? Lock it up in a lockbox. We have gun lock cables, storage cabinets. Give the key to a trusted friend or family member until you can get through that crisis. And we found that that worked better than just confiscating the weapon completely because people weren't going to be honest about having a weapon. Next slide. So most suicidal crises are brief and the time from decision to act is usually less than an hour. So these are some studies that we looked at here where less than five minutes, it was 24%, less than 20 minutes, 48%, and within an hour, 71%. So again, it goes back to building the time and space in between the thought and when they act on it. And so we want to build in the time and space in between there. Next slide. So lethal mean safety, it does work. And reducing access to lethal suicide methods is one of the few population level interventions that has been shown to decrease suicide rates. And about 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt do not necessarily go on to die by suicide. So what we have done at the VA is that we have uh, collaborated with the veterans ahead of time. We've um, helped them survive the suicidal crisis. We educated the providers. We educated family members about locking these weapons up making sure that if that person is in a crisis, that there's a place where that weapon is safely and securely uh, stored. And if we've done all of that, we have likely prevented suicide for the rest of their lives. Next slide. So suicide is preventable. It is preventable despite what you may hear, it is preventable. So now I'm gonna ask you guys a few questions. Get ready, I want you guys to get your fingers ready to uh, type in the box. 
Next slide. So this is this a myth or reality? People who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. Is that a myth or reality? People who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. I see a couple of myths in the box. Okay, okay. You guys are doing good, you're doing good. Next slide. So no matter how casually or jokingly said, suicide threats should never be ignored and they may indicate serious suicidal feelings. So someone who talks about suicide provides an opportunity to intervene before that behavior occurs. So, you know, they may not actually have a plan or intent to do something at that moment, but clearly if they're talking about suicide, clearly they, they have some issues that are going on that need to be addressed. And it allows you that opportunity to in intervene. So let me give you an example of that. John is your friend. You, you work in different offices in the same area and John is gonna meet up with you for lunch one day. So as you're walking to a restaurant or wherever you're gonna go for lunch, John says to you, I'm just so over this divorce. I can't take it anymore. I could just, you know, I, I, I could just jump in front of a bus. You know, I'm gonna lose my house. I'm gonna lose my car. I'm gonna have to pay alimony. I'm gonna have to pay child support. I'm gonna have to fight for visitation. I, I could just jump in front of this bus and be done with it all. Now, clearly John is overwhelmed. He has a lot going on, divorce. Remember I told you relationship breakups, those are huge. He's going through a divorce. He's concerned about finances, losing his home. He, he's gonna have to fight for uh, visitation rights. There's a lot going on with John. And he says to you, I, I could just jump in front of that bus. He may not have a plan or intent to harm himself or to commit suicide at that moment, but clearly what he's telling you is that I'm overwhelmed and I need some help. Okay, and so that's where you want to go ahead and intervene because he's telling you already all these things are going on and I need some help. Next slide. Another question for you guys. The only one who can really help someone who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or therapist. Is that a myth or reality? The only one who can really help someone who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or therapist. Okay, I see lots of myths typed in the box. You are correct. Next slide. So special training is not required to safely raise the subject of suicide. So helping someone feel included and showing genuine heartfelt support can make a big difference during a challenging time. So like with John, just showing support and raising the subject, it can really help someone feel included and in showing them some uh, concern and some heartfelt support. So you don't need to be specially trained. You don't need to be a licensed therapist. You just need to be compassionate and a good listener. Okay, next slide. Now I'm gonna go over the steps of VA SAVE. And as I said earlier, VA SAVE, it's our gatekeeper training. It's gonna help communities learn how to help veterans at risk for suicide. And you can pretty much use it with anyone. Um, it's going to help you act with care and compassion if you encounter a person who's in a suicidal crisis. And so you don't have to remember this acronym, but this is what we use at the VA. S, signs of suicide thinking should be recognized. A, ask the most important question of all. And I want to ask you guys that now. Do you know what the most important question of all to ask is? What is that question? I want you to type it in the box. Ask the most important question of all. What is that question? Okay. And I'm going to give you the answer when we get to the A. Validate that person's experience, encourage treatment, and expedite getting help. Okay. Next slide. So let's start with S signs of suicidal thinking. So you want to learn how to recognize these warning signs. Hopelessness. You'll see a lot of that in veterans, especially those that are struggling with uh, substance abuse. Uh, unemployment, homelessness, you're going to see a lot of that, that hopelessness, feeling like there's no way out of their situation. Anxiety. Remember I told you these untreated mental health issues, anxiety is one of them. What is anxiety? Anxiety is that feeling of nervousness. Something is about to happen. Not sure what, not sure when, not sure who. Some people will have physical symptoms. Some people feel nauseated. Some people have sweaty palms. 
Some people start to feel claustrophobic. Some people will have a full-blown panic attack where the heart is racing, feels like it's gonna pop out of their chest, okay? Agitation, sleeplessness, or mood swings, feeling like there's no reason to live. And when you have all of those stressors, many times people start to feel like they have no reason to live. Rage and anger, this is one of the signs of suicidal thinking. And one thing about rage and anger that we know as clinicians is that rage and anger is usually a mask for something else. It's easy to be angry than to feel other emotions. And so what we know is that rage and anger, for a lot of people, it's a learned behavior. It's a learned behavior because they learn it very early on. But when you peel back those layers of that rage and anger, we can usually find some mental health issues, whether it's depression, anxiety, maybe even some PTSD. We can find a lot of that behind that rage and anger. But it's just easier to use the mask. Engaging in risky activities without thinking. You know, um, there's some drawbacks of being a clinician. And I will say, because every time I go outside, I think that's risky activity. You know, but when we talk about risky activity, we're really talking about engaging in things like, you know, driving at high rates, high rates of speed, uh, motorcycles, going 90 to 100 miles an hour, no helmet on, weaving in and out of traffic. This, this is really risky behavior, you know, um, it's almost like Russian roulette, you know, so when you see people start engaging in those activities, you know, you really have to pay attention to what's really going on with them. Increasing alcohol and drug use. Remember what I said about alcohol and drugs, mood altering substances. So when you start to get involved in mood altering substances, especially if you're dealing with mental health issues, it's only gonna exacerbate the situation. So uh, mood altering substances, your judgment is not good and people make irrational decisions when they're involved with alcohol and drugs, and then those underlying mental health issues, and then withdrawing from family and friends. Next slide. So more signs of suicidal thinking. So the presence of any of the following signs require immediate attention. So thinking about hurting or killing themselves, looking for ways to die. And you know, there is a million and one things that you can do to the 10th power. And so don't be fooled that, you know, this person's with me, we're in this room, they're not going to do anything, or I'm just going to let them go sit in the room by themselves. They've already told me they're suicidal. Believe me, there's a million and one things that you can use and that people have done. So don't, don't sleep on that. Talking about death, dying, or suicide and self-destructive risk-taking behavior, especially when it involves alcohol, drugs, and weapons. So remember I told you, when you're involved in alcohol and drugs, mood altering substances, your judgment is off. We have seen cases where people are depressed. They've decided that they want to uh, drink. They want to, uh, you know, get drunk. They want to get high because they want to relieve the pain. But the reality is that everything that you're trying to dismiss is still there and it's going to be greater when you sober up. And so the, um, uh, Impaired judgment happens when, let's say, if they have a weapon and they're under the influence and they decide, well, you know, I'm going to clean my weapon. But now you're so depressed. Now you start thinking, well, maybe I should just use my weapon on myself, you know. So it's that kind of irrational thinking that starts to happen. Next slide. So, A, ask the most important question of all. So I'm going to go back and see what you guys typed in the, in the box. So someone said, uh, are you, do you have a plan? Um, what else? Are you suicidal? Do you want, do you want suicide? Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan to kill? Do you have plans to kill yourself? Okay. All good answers. Let's get the correct answer here. Next slide. So. This is the, the question that we wanna ask. Are you thinking about killing yourself? This is the question we wanna ask and this is the way we wanna ask it. Are you thinking about killing yourself? The reason we wanna ask that question this way is because we wanna be clear as to what the person is gonna respond, how they're gonna respond. If I say, are you thinking about harming yourself? 
well, you know, harm could be many things to many people. You know, uh, Mr. Washington was in the Marines, you know, harming himself could just be, you know, driving in DC, you might wanna harm yourself. You know, for me, it might be something totally different. So we have to make sure we're asking this question this way because there's no deviation from the answer is either yes or no. We're not gonna leave it up to chance. So the question is, are you thinking about killing yourself? Ask that question that way, that way we know that we can get one answer when we ask it that way. Next slide. And then when you ask the question, these are some things that you wanna consider. So things that you do wanna do when you ask the question, ask the question if you've identified the warning signs or symptoms. So think about that scenario I gave you with John. He's going through a divorce. He made a statement, I'm tired of this, I can just jump in front of that bus. He's going through financial issues. He's going through a relationship breakup. These are all classic things on that list. So you've identified some of those warning signs. So you wanna go ahead and ask that question because you've identified at least half a dozen of them, okay? Next, you wanna ask the question in a way that it flows naturally with the conversation, okay? You wanna make sure that it flows with the conversation. So you're talking to John, he's telling you all this stuff. And you say, John, wow, you sure got a lot going on. It appears that you're overwhelmed. Are you having any thoughts of killing yourself? Are you thinking about, this is the way you wanna ask that question. You wanna make sure that it flows with the conversation because clearly he has a lot going on. Now to change that scenario, if John had just said to you, you know, I'm going through this divorce, I may have to move out of the house, I gotta give up one vehicle, visitation is gonna be tough, or I'm gonna get one weekend a month. But he doesn't say, he says to you, it's gonna be tough, but he doesn't say that, you know, he feels like jumping in front of a bus. He doesn't say that. So you wanna make sure that, you know, you find those warning signs in that, in that conversation with John. You wanna make sure that you identify those warning signs. And even if he doesn't say it, you can still offer him some resources. John, it sounds like you're going through a whole lot. Are you working with somebody? Are you talking to somebody? You may need to talk to someone about everything that's going on through this divorce, okay? And things that you don't wanna do. Don't ask the question as if you're looking for a no answer. So if you say to John, you're not gonna kill yourself, are you? Well, if you say you're not going to kill yourself, then you've told John he's not going to do it. So there's no way he's gonna answer you honestly because you've already answered for him. You're not going to, okay? And so if you say you aren't thinking of killing yourself, that's a, that's a no already in the question. So, you know, let me give you another example of that. Um, uh, my daughter, you know, she uh, wears these shoes, Crocs, C-R-O-C-S. I don't like those shoes. I don't think they're really made for walking. I think they're made for the beach, but that's my personal opinion. But every opportunity she gets, she puts those shoes on and it just drives me nuts. So this is how I get a no answer ahead of her. When she puts on those shoes, the first thing I say to her is, Nicole, you're not wearing those shoes, are you? And her response is, no, ma'am, because I've already said you're not wearing them. If I wanted her to answer honestly, I would say, Nicole, what shoes are you wearing today? That allows her to pick whichever shoe she wants. But if I say you're not wearing those shoes, that means no. There is no other answer that's going to come behind that. So you want to be able to ask the question in a way that you can get an honest answer back. Are you thinking about killing yourself? You want to be able to get a yes or no answer from John. And don't wait to ask the question when someone is halfway out the door. You know, you're having lunch with John. He already shared with you all these things are going on. You finish lunch. You're getting ready to go back to your office. He's getting ready to go back to his office. John, are you thinking about killing yourself? Now you you have to get back to work. You know, when you identify, you want to be at, be able to ask these questions early enough so that you can intervene and get him some help. Okay. Next slide. V. Validate that person's experience. I cannot emphasize how much this is important. When you validate someone, you let them know that they matter their opinion mattered, and that you are willing to listen to them. Because see, you know, in this country, I can only speak from my experience in this country, growing up, you know, you're not validated much. You know, you're pretty much told to be quiet, you know, most of your life. 
You know, I remember the first time I was ever told to basically shut up. That was maybe five years old. Because children should be seen and not heard. So you need to be quiet. That's the first time, you know, when I think back. And then, you know, you got to think about this. Someone hears this as a child. And then you have a military person who joins the military, maybe 18, 19 years old. They're going through basic training. And what happens? Shut up and color. Shut up and get in line. So now your voice is squashed again. You're not being heard. Uh, you know, and sometimes you can go in the work arena. I'm the boss. You be quiet. You know, so it's very difficult. And so when people are struggling and they're going through challenges, sometimes they just want to be able to vent. They want to be able to state what's wrong with them, what's going on, what they're feeling, and just being heard. People just want to be heard. And many times when people are going through a crisis, they know that there's nothing singularly that you can do to change everything. But at least if you're willing to listen, just be a listen, a listener, a good listener. So you want to be able to talk openly about suicide, be willing to listen and allow that person to express his or her own feelings. Recognize that the situation is serious because it is. And don't pass judgment. One thing we know as human beings, we can pick up very quickly when someone is passing judgment on us. And it's a huge turnoff. And so if you pass judgment, it's going to be the conversation will be shut down. So you just want to be open. Don't pass judgment. Reassure them that help is available because help is available. Next slide. E. Encourage treatment and expedite getting help. So what should you do if you think someone is suicidal? First, you don't want to keep it a secret. This is not the type of secret that you want to keep. You want to get help for this individual. Don't leave him or her alone. Remember what I said, anything can be used. Don't think that you can just leave them in the room after they told you that they're having thoughts of killing themselves. Anything can be used. So don't leave him or her alone. Try to get that person to seek immediate help from his own doctor or the nearest emergency room. Call 911 if you need to. Reassure them that help is available. Call the Veterans Crisis Line. Remember earlier what I said, you don't have to call that 1-800 number. Now you can just dial 988 the same way you dial 911. And then just press number one. And if it's a veteran, they'll get a veteran responder. If it's just a civilian, you'll get the National Crisis Line. It's the same number. Only difference is the, we have veteran responders if you press number one. Next slide. So when talking with uh, someone who's at risk for suicide, these are the things that you want to be able to do. First, you want to remain calm. Don't get all excited because that's not going to help the situation. Just remain calm. Listen more than you speak. Remember what I said. Sometimes people just need to vent. They need to be heard. They need to know that you're listening. They need to know that you're validating them. So listen more than you speak. Maintain good eye contact. The worst thing that you can do is when somebody is seeking help from you, be off in a different direction. Looking at a book, looking at your phone, just looking at other things. That's not going to be helpful. And it, and it makes the person feel like you're just dismissing them. You know, it's like when you walk into an establishment and, you know, the person at the front desk is looking down at the phone or they're writing and they say, how can I help you? Well, if you can't even look me in the eye, how, how can you help me? You know, so you want to make sure that you maintain uh, eye contact. You want to act with confidence. Don't argue with that individual. Leave all of those controversial uh, topics alone. Race, religion, COVID, don't go there because everybody has their heels dug in and it's just going to be a no win, no win situation. So stay away from all of those topics. Use open body language. Don't be like Macaulay Culkin on Home Alone with the shock face. You know, don't do that. Limit your questions. Let that person do the talking. Use supportive and encouraging comments. Let them know that you care. But be honest that there's no quick solution, but help is available. Help is available. So you want to make sure that you at least express that. Next slide. What should you do if someone is on the phone and they're suicidal? First, you want to keep the caller on the line. Don't hang up or transfer that call. 
And I can't emphasize this enough, but I will tell you for myself, I don't transfer enough calls to become good at it. And so if I have someone on the line who's in crisis, this is not the time to figure it out. So don't hang up or transfer it. Just keep that person on the call. Remain calm. Try to get as much identifying information on that caller as possible. Their name, their phone number, their current location. It doesn't matter how much you get. Just try to get as much as possible. Now, there are people who are good at conferencing calls, and those are usually our um, switchboard operators. You know, they usually are pretty good with uh, transferring those calls. But if you're not good at it, I would not do it. But our call center folks and our switchboard operators, they know how to call the crisis line and still be on the line until the responder picks up. So they know how to do those calls. Um, if you have to try to get your coworkers to help you with assistance, you can use instant messaging and teams. You may have to use your own personal cell phone, text someone if you're on a call and someone is suicidal, we're fortunate working for the government, we have our own personal cell phones and then we have government cell phones. So I could be on the government cell phone, but if, and I'm talking to someone, I can actually message someone else. Or if I'm at my um, computer, I can message someone to, through Teams and say, hey, I have this person on the line, I need help. This is where they're located. And you can get your uh, team members to help you. If the caller disconnects, call them back immediately. If they don't answer, then you wanna go ahead and call 911. Let them know that you were on the phone with that individual, you got disconnected, you would like them to do a welfare check just to see if that person's okay. And after you do that, then you can go ahead and dial 988 and report that information to the Veterans Crisis Line. And they will um, also reach out to that individual as well. Next slide. So that was the uh, VA SAVE training. So signs of suicidal thinking should be recognized. Ask the most important question of all, and that question is, are you thinking of killing yourself? Validate that person's experience, make them feel like they're important and that you're willing to listen to what they have to say. Encourage treatment and expedite getting help because help is available. Now we're gonna go ahead and we have a few moments to go into some resources, next slide. So 988, so 988 just came aboard in uh, July of 2022. So we used to call the 1-800-273-8255, but now you just dial 988. It works just like 911. If it's a veteran or active duty service member, then you press number one. Everybody else just hold the line and you'll go ahead and get a civilian responder. Anybody can call 988, which is the uh, veterans crisis line, um, veterans, active duty service members, family members, friends, you can even call anonymously. So anyone can call that number. Next slide. So here it is, the uh, slide again, next slide. And I just told you 988 came into enactment in July of 2022. However, the uh, 10 digit number still will be available until we uh, make sure that every place in the country has 988 up and running. So we are gonna get there, but I would figure it's gonna be at least another two or three years before it phases out completely. Next slide. So this is the Veterans Crisis Line. It was stood up in 2007 and it has been going strong ever since. Over 6 million uh, telephone calls received, over 700,000 chats, 250,000 text messages, and over 1.1 million referrals and over 230,000 dispatches of emergency services. Next slide. Don't wait, reach out. So that's a website that the VA has. And actually, if you go on that website, there's a whole bunch of resources that can be used. The neat thing about this uh, Don't Wait, Reach Out website is that if you go in there and let's say you need education resources, you may need some housing resources, you can click on the things that you need and once you press enter, then that one compressed list will come up. So it's like a one-stop shopping. Next slide. Make, make the connection. So this is a, vi this is a video that has um, some vignettes on there and it's veterans who are talking about their struggles with mental health issues and suicide and how they sought help and recovered. 
So this is a good um, tool to use to encourage people to get help and see that uh, help is available and it does work. Next slide. National uh, Shooting Sports Foundation, we've done a lot of partnership with them, and you may have even seen some of the ads on TV, even through the Ad Council, where they're talking about safe storage of weapons and um, just securing them. So um, this is a good good website to check out. And, um, you know, like I said, the National Sports and Shooting, Shooting Foundation, this is huge because they're actually putting the information out there for uh, veterans to lock up their weapons. Next slide. Keep it secure that net. So that's another partner. Next slide. And new uh, lethal means safety resources. So remember earlier I talked about educating family members, friends, providers. So this is the new lethal means safety resources. Next slide. Mental health apps. So there's a lot of free apps um, that we have that people can download. Um, PTSD coach, COVID coach, things for families. We just recommend that um, you use these in conjunction with your provider, your therapist. Um, you know, the apps are not just made to use alone and you're going to be cured from every issue you have, but they're made to enhance your treatment. Next slide. And that's the uh, safety plan in the PTSD coach. Next slide. Coaching and care. This is a great resource for uh, family members who uh, may have a veteran who needs help and who's resisting, and they can refer them to coaching. Well, they can call coaching in the care and coaching in the care will give them some resources and tips on how to get that person in the care. They may even speak to the individual themselves. Next slide. Postvention resources. So any of our um, clergy or um, organizational managers out there, we never really talk a lot about postvention, but this is a much needed resource and so um, the communities have to be ready in the workplace, you know, when situations happen. So these are resources out there through the VA. Next slide. And then our SAVE training. This training is available on the uh, internet. You can go to psycharmor.org and it takes about 25 minutes. All you have to do is just register and it's free. And so we encourage you to share it with um, family, friends, institutions. Next slide. That's it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Mr. Washington and let's see if there's any questions out there for me. Hey, thanks, Lily. Uh, once again, a uh, great brief as usual. Very, uh, very good information. I know it's helpful. Let's get to the questions. Uh, and if we don't get to all the questions, uh, we have your emails. We will uh, uh, reach out to you to make sure that uh, Lily gets that. The first question comes from McKinsey County veterans. Many organizations offer text options for those contemplating suicide. Uh, has it proven been uh, has it been proven effective? It seems cold and distant, an unfavorable option in my opinion. But I'm willing to learn if it has proved effective. Well, I would tell you that it has proved effective because our younger folks they don't talk as much over the phone, so they are using technology. They're texting, and we do have that chat, and we do have the text with the Veterans Crisis Line. So yes, it does work. And so um, it should be in your resources. When you get a copy of the resources, the uh, text number is there. Thanks, Lily. Appreciate it. Uh, question two comes from SM Ofti. I don't know if that's Sergeant Major, but SM Ofti. Uh, as a DAV service officer, I deal with vets experiencing crisis. Frequently, uh, filing paperwork triggers them further. Uh, they frequently at, have great difficulty getting a PTSD provider appointment uh, at the VA hospital. And then uh, he asked about thoughts. They asked about thoughts on that. Well, I mean, you can always reach out to the crisis line if they're there in your office and they're experiencing a crisis. And one of the things about, you know, getting help is that they've got to get that claim in so that they can get the help that they need. Also, um, if they haven't received their claim yet, we still have provisions where um, the VA can see you irregardless. So they, if they're in a crisis, they can go right to that ER and they will be seen. Yeah, thanks, Lily. Uh, question three comes from D. Smith. It says, what are the most important things that need to be done or said immediately by a helper of a person at risk? Any stats or back uh, to back these up? What should a helper not do or say when encountering someone considering suicide? Well, I don't have the uh, stats available right now, but I will tell you this. You know, anytime someone is saying these type of things, you want to take them seriously. Don't ignore it. 
You know, um, we have people who we say, oh, they're looking for attention, those kind of things. There's a reason that people are doing things. And so you want to take them seriously. You, you definitely want to take them seriously. You want to find out what's going on and then get them the appropriate resources. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lily. Um, getting down here, a few more here to go. Uh, from 5th of Diana Ellis, question four says, does poison include a drug overdose? Yes, that would be considered poisoning. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. if someone takes a lethal amount of the medication, yes, that's poisoning. Right. Yes. Okay. Question five uh, from D. Smith says, would uh, would love to hear more about the time and safety buffer called safe harbor for people who have firearms. Um, I don't have that information with me. Okay. We'll get back with you, D. Uh, hang in there. She'll, she'll reach back out. We have your email. Question six is from Geraldo Morales. Uh, as a potential cause of suicide, is V looking into over uh, the counter prescribing of psychostropic, which are antidepressants, medications which have side effects like suicidal ideations? Uh, is there a connection between the over prescribing of opiates and vet suicide as it was in the military back in uh, 14 and 16? Are there other alternative means of treatment besides prescription drugs to treat veterans' behavioral health issues like depression or anxiety? Uh, says that my perception is providers first option is to prescribe meds. Actually, it's the opposite. <laughs> we try to go with the lowest treatment available, the lowest, the lesser of the treatment. So, you know, um, in my clinical days uh, that we start out with the lowest treatment first. And if that doesn't work, then it progresses. But yeah, there are a whole variety of options of treatment that are available. Um, the key is is getting that person engaged in those treatments. But yes, there are definitely, and and the VA is looking at you know um, you know medications and you know um, and actually um, there's a way that providers can dispense meds and so that people don't get to stockpile meds that they can be dispensed on a lower level. So yes. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, the next question, we have two more to go. Uh, the problem is what to do next when or if they say yes. So you want to uh, continue talking with that individual. Let them know that you are there to help them. Let them know that you are willing to escort them to the nearest ER and be willing to stay with them until they get seen. Thank you, Lily. Uh, last, well, next to the last question, I think I have... Um, William typing here, McKenzie County veteran says many organizations offer tax options for those contemplating suicide. Has it been proven effective? It seems cold and distant, uh, an unfavorable option in my opinion, but I'm willing to learn if it has proved effective. So is it I think effective? We got that one. I think Within? we answered that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question is from Catherine. Are there opportunities for volunteering in field calls to field calls? Well, um, you know, um, I know for the, um, the national crisis line, which is the same number, I'm sure they seek volunteers with the VA, you know, it's all employed and they use a lot of peer support, but, um, we do have voluntary services. So, um, I would check those out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just 1 more popped up. We've got a little time left here. Uh, Paulette Meeks asked, uh, I'm a parish nurse. If I know members, formerly military members that, uh, what can I give them to let you know? Uh, your organization exists. I'm probably going to answer that, but go ahead. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, uh, look, look at our website. Uh, right. We have a lot of resources on there. And also, you're going to get resources after, um, you know, this presentation where they can reach out. And definitely, I would say the don't wait, reach out. That's one of the key uh, websites that we have where it encompasses a lot of resources. Right, right. absolutely. Hey, look, thank you, Lily. Once again, I'm so glad you detailed to our office as a clinician and just uh, your, your wealth of knowledge and your experience. And I know it was impactful uh, based on the in interaction we had. So thank you so much for, uh, again, uh, you know, presenting. Uh, thank all of you for joining us, uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't leave you uh, with a little nugget. Uh, so the nugget is something called the PAC Act. What is it formally? It's formally called the Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson honoring our promise to address Comprehensive Toxins Act. Basically, the PAC Act, P-A-C-T. What is it? Uh, it's a uh, act that was a, uh, signed by the president last year of August. It expanded health care and benefits for millions of veterans and their survivors, including Vietnam, the Gulf War, and post-9-11 veterans. Uh, what is it specifically? Many uh, members were exposed to toxic hazards and other environmental hazards. So please 
uh, learn more about PAC Act and you're saying, well, Congressman, how do we find out about it? Guess what? This office right here, same time, Tuesday, March the 21st, that's two weeks, Tuesday, March the 21st, we will have an overview of the PAC Act. So please join us so you, we can share information with you. Uh, with that being said, thank you all very much and you have a blessed day and blessed week.